Divine Truth. Name of this presentation is Positively Responding to Spirit Influence. And it is part of Spirit Relationship Series. It was presented in Mergen, Queensland, Australia on the 7th of October, 2012. This is Session 2, Part 2. Okay, well I suppose the question is, do we proceed with your questions about the previous subject or do we move on to the new? <laughs> There's still two more, two more things <laughs> to go. <laughs> But it might be session number three coming up sometime in the future. Um, it will be good if we could try to cover the material today, though. Does anyone have a burning question still within them? Karen. Karen, fire away. You got the mic with you? Yep. It is about the um, overcloaking. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. Um, at Mary's workshop a couple of years ago, I was really angry and I was um, asked to leave because of that. Yes. And... Sometime late last year, you said something to me in passing about when I was overcloaked there. Yes. So then I'm thinking, if an overcloaking spirit is in a better condition of love than me, and they're angry, and I'm angry, I can't quite understand how that works. Yeah, well, you see, again, you're analysing everything I'm saying intellectually rather than feeling about what I'm saying. So let's uh, discuss that. Remember we talked, overcloaking is when a person is overcloaked for most of their life. Right, yeah. and uh, and a lot of times we are in a worse condition than the person overcloaking us. Also, oftentimes we are in just the same condition as a person who is influencing us from the spirit world. And in a, in the moment of rage, you lowered your condition to the point where a woman in the spirit world who had experienced the Holocaust in Germany. Who, who, could, who, who now had huge amounts of rage, could overcloak you and then begin to express herself through you. And whenever you get yourself into these kind of rages, you are temporarily lowering your own condition to the point where almost anyone in the spirit world can connect with you. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So remember that the statements about overcloaking were more about permanency with overcloaking spirits. In your case, you experienced a temporary overcloaking, which happens to most people in the course of their life. And uh, we've had it happen in our relationship <laughs> and so forth as well. Um, and it only happens when we lower our condition and refuse to deal with certain emotions that are being triggered at the time. If we are actually open and, and humble to the emotion that was triggered at the time, it's very rare for an overcloaking experience to occur. But if, as soon as you are not humble to the underlying emotion, in your case, you weren't humble to some fear that you had. This caused you to become enraged. And when you become enraged, you lowered your condition temporarily. And in that place, bang, anybody pretty much in the spirit world who's in a similar place can connect with you and express themselves through you. Thank yeah. you. Does that make sense? That's how many murders occur, actually. Many murders occur through exactly that process. A person lowering their condition temporarily through some un unhealed emotion that they are unwilling to be humbled to experience without harming somebody. And then before they know it, they've been overcloaked by a spirit who feels very much the same and they've taken an action that it has harmed and killed somebody else. Yeah. So very, we very need dangerous. to maybe clarify that point about the condition, yeah? In that... Um and a lot of times, yeah, I feel a lot of times too, many of us overestimate our own spiritual condition. You didn't like that comment much, eh? <laughs> we overestimate our own spiritual condition. Many of you do have similar levels of rage to a murderer in the spirit world who would overcloak you under certain circumstances. And you're not aware of it at the moment because you heavily suppress it. Does that make sense? And the, in the heavily, heavy suppression of the emotion, there is a denial of the emotion. There's a denial that the emotion exists within. When we deny that an emotion exists within, what we finish up doing is creating circumstances that are, are, are there to expose the emotion. If we allow ourselves to experience the emotion, we won't damage another person. If we have some ethics, 
if we have some focus on truth, if we have our feet shod with the peace, you know, we want peace rather than violence, then we would not respond to such a spirit. But, as, but many of us don't have those kind of feelings. And so what happens when a feeling overcomes us that we're in denial of, you know, ethics go out the window, peace goes out the window, truth goes out the window. And before we know it, we're pretty much doing exactly what a spirit who's in the same state wants us to do. And in that place, we can have hordes of spirits come to us even in that, in that particular moment. So we can, we can both, we can lower our condition in an instant through taking a certain course of action. A beautiful uh, part of the Robert James Lee's books where he says that issues of the rest of our life often turn on a diamond point. And what he meant by that is that often it's just one tiny, little, sharp decision that is made that it can affect the rest of our life negatively if we do not have these kind of protective things to guide our life. Yep. Thanks, Karen. Um, so, so I, I need to ask a question to uh, clarify yeah, that. Let's yeah. go with Mary first and then um, uh, Nancy. if you leave your yeah. hand up. Um, uh, so, if, so when we make that decision, though, and we act, we kind of become fertile ground. Do you want to stand where you're speaking? Yeah, we kind of become fertile ground for the spirit, don't we? Yes. For the negative spirit, rather than God's truth. Yes. And then they add their intention to our own, yes. and ours is to suppress or deny. They add theirs. We take a course of action that actually does degrade our soul condition. Yes. So, in that in that sense. Someone in a lesser condition can overcloak us. Well, that we have lowered our condition temporarily to enable them to overcloak us. And then in overcloaking us, they can influence us to make a choice or decision that degrades our condition that could also result in our being permanently overcloaked by a person. Sure. I have met many people in this life where that has happened in our personal interactions. Where a person, for example, comes to me and they say, uh, AJ, I'm willing to get any feedback from you that you're willing to give me. Now, you're opening a can of worms there when you say that, right? <laughs> but anyway, I take a person at face value and say, no worries, here's the feedback. And I don't plan when to say it or how to say it or how public or non-public it is, I just say it. Because they've said to me they're open to any feedback and I've taken them at their word. From that moment on, many people have become very enraged. All of a sudden, groups of spirits who dislike myself attach to them, and then they've, they've, some of them have spent the rest of their life since that moment just attacking me. They've spent their resources, money, websites, all sorts of things just to attack me, just because they are unwilling to actually receive the feedback that they said originally they were willing to receive. In that moment, what they did was they asked for feedback. So they were on the path, if you like, of trying to discover more truth. They got feedback that they did not want to hear. right? And instead of going, well, I don't want to hear that, so that's fine, they decided to have feet that ran to violence. right? And as soon as you make that kind of active decision, you're going to have a lot of spirit mates helping you with that decision. And so you, have, you become overcoked by spirits. And now those spirits in you acting out of violence degrade your condition. Not because, I, because I'm anyone special, but because any person you attack is going to degrade your own condition. Every time you attack somebody, you're acting violently, you're going to degrade your own condition. And so they're degrading their condition, degrading their condition every time they engage this attack. Now, the more they engage the attack, the more they degrade their condition, the more these spirits can have influence over them. And eventually some of these people have gotten to the point now where they're not even living their own life anymore. They're living the life of the spirits who are overcloaking them. That's how a spirit who is in less condition than you finishes up helping you get into the same condition they are. Right? By you having openings in this area of how you put on your suit of armour. And as soon as you have openings, there is a possibility of temporarily lowering your condition in a moment. 
And because you're not staying firm to some of these principles, spirits overcloak you in that moment. And instead of recognizing the mistake, which is an option, you choose actively to act in harmony with the mistake you've just made. And as soon as you start doing that, you are on a very, very fast, slippery slope downwards right, into the hills. And eventually, you will end up being overcloaked generally by the groups of spirits who, who influenced you in that degree, to that degree. Yep. So we've met people who are not overcloaked. We've had discussions with them where they've said they're open. We've said something to them that they have been either offended or angered or upset by. And after that point in time, lowered their conditions through the desire to attack. And as a result of that, from that moment on, became overcloaked. So just as many people who have benefited from what we're talking about have actually harmed themselves from what we're talking about because of this. Hmm. It's a sobering thought, isn't it? In a way. You know, unless we're willing to act in harmony with these principles of ethics, of morality, of truth, peace, faith, unless we're going to act in harmony with these particular principles, eventually we'll be led by any person who wants to attack us, we'll be led down a path that eventually creates our own destruction. The destruction, not that our soul can be destroyed, but our, the actual soul is so shriveled in the end that, that it's, we're, we're definitely not, which we'll talk about soon, being saved right? from, from the results of those actions. Karen, could I just add that in that situation in the workshop, I felt there was a lot of very rageful spirits around you that you're used to doing what they say. You're terrified um, of them. When there was a challenge put to them around th their control of you, just by your participation, you became very frightened. And because I was consistent about it, it I feel you, they became more enraged. You became so frightened that then you were willing just to be angry with me because of the level of terror that was coming up in you about not doing what they said. Yeah. So I feel that some of it was your rage in response to avoiding terror, um, but then also obviously cause, because you avoided the terror and went into your own rage, they could add to that as well. Mm. Yeah. Yep. yeah. No, that's exactly right. Okay. Nancy. There. Hello. Where were we next? Just here. Oh, Nancy. <laughs> Hello. Um, actually, it's just two questions that kind of go together, if yep. I may. Uh, my first one was the permanent overcloaking of a baby from a baby. Of a baby, yes. Yes. Um, how then does that person who don't, doesn't ever know they're overcloaked, how do they actually come out of that? Or, or has someone else got to work with them to help them? Or it's very, How very difficult, happen? to be honest. Um, the reason why a baby uh, is permanently overcloaked, so let's say this is the baby and you've got mum and dad, it's the combination of mum and dad's emotions that allow this child to be overcloaked. Now, those emotions have obviously also been absorbed by the child in the sense the child's been living with these emotions all of its formulative years, and so the child accepts that those emotions are normal. What will happen with this child who's permanently overcloaked is eventually somebody or people will start noticing that there's irregularities in their behaviour. It's like they have two personalities. And sometimes they'll have a personality that seems to be one type of person, and then other times they'll have a personality that seems to be another. Unfortunately, what often happens under those circumstances is the medical profession notices them, which is good that they're noticed, but then they medicate them which actually all it does is attempt to suppress the link and most medication only suppresses the link between the spirit and the person. Often this person has an addiction by this time to the spirit. They have no understanding of what is going on. So the best way to help any situation with regard to spirit overcoking is to tell the truth. Truth is the most important thing, but, but, but that has to be a person who knows the truth, who, who's the person who needs to tell it. So if we notice somebody is exhibiting a behaviour that sometimes seems to be one personality or sometimes seems to be another, it would be an act of love to say, look, sometimes I notice you're one person and sometimes I notice you're another. Have you ever considered that perhaps you're overcloaked by a spirit a lot of the time? So that spirit still allows the person 
to be themselves at times. Well, never usually a... the only time that they allow the person to be themselves, uh, there's usually only a couple of times. One time is usually if that feels, the spirit feels that their relationship with the person is not threatened by the activity the person wants to engage in. So that's one time. The other time is when the spirit can no longer maintain energy and has to recharge, sort of recharge their own energy to, allow, to influence the person due to the exhaustion of the energy between the person and the spirit. Because quite often the spirit is actually trying to maintain the person's life in order to maintain the connection. So under those two circumstances, generally there'll be a break, if you like. But, uh, and you'll notice if you're living with the person, uh, you'll notice the break generally. So, or if you're you know, a close friend of the person, you'll notice the break. The key is to always just tell the truth and allow the person to make up a decision. What we've found is the person who's overcloaked, who has an addiction to being overcloaked, and many people do, uh, they are very, very difficult to convince um, most of the time because they, uh, they and the spirit ha wants to maintain the connection. So when you've got a situation like that, there's very little you can do. If their behaviour becomes psychotic in nature, which often it does under these circumstances, then of course the medical profession's response is probably the most logical response because there's very little else you can do until the person themselves is educated about the truth. It does not help, though, when this person is told that there is no such thing as spirits and there's no such thing as, you know, and the medic, you, you've only got a mental illness and all those kind of things, because unfortunately what that does is it tells the person that they've got a physical ailment rather than an interaction with spirit problem. And, uh, and that is quite damaging, actually. And in fact, people who are told that very rarely recover for the rest of their life. They are usually on medication for the rest of their life on earth. And the only time they recognise a change is after they pass into the spirit world and they are no longer overcloaked. Right. So prayer, um, in what way would one pray for help for that person? Um, what would you be actually asking for? If it was me, I'd be praying for an opportunity to, if I knew the truth about the situation, I'd be praying for an opportunity to be able to um, have a conversation with the person about the situation. And also I'd be praying for help from our spirit friends to create an opportunity where this person is not influenced by the spirit with them while I'm talking to them. Right. Because if they're influenced by the spirit with them while we're, we're having a discussion, the spirit will most, most likely govern the outcome of the discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, can I just um, ask the next Certainly. Quick question? Certainly. Um, I just want to know the difference. I still have, I spoke to you a long time ago about this and you might not remember, but I have um, quite a few hours sometimes, up to 12 or 13 hours that I have absolutely no memory of. Yes. So... Um, I still am doing that, even though I've done lots of things you suggested about staying in my body and yep. whatever. Can that be? How do we know the difference bec um, between overcloaking and just as you suggested, leaving my body? Um, and I don't know. I, don't, I haven't got any idea about what I do. So. Well, when you are overcloaked, you often do not have any idea of what you do either. Yeah, yeah that's and why it, I wondered when you said that, whether it, yeah, it could actually be that rather than... It's very rare for a person who leaves their body to not be overcloaked at the time when they leave their body. The reason why is whenever you vacate responsibility for your own body, there's often a lot of, like I said, there's at least three spirits around every person waiting for access. Um, and so, you know, this then allows opportunities for other spirits to take over. And for it to be such a long duration, you can ob obviously you must do things and say things to people and sleep and wake up and all sorts of things happen in between. And it's not you controlling that, it's somebody else. So, so my suggestion is still the same with you. And I know you believe you've worked on them, but... Probably not enough. No, yeah. I'm not saying I've worked enough. Uh, obviously my suggestion I'm is very it. much about your fear. Fear that I don't want to... Fear about your experience, with. your own personal life experience and your own personal emotional experience. A lot of it's got to do with your childhood and what your parents did with you and, and what that uh, created in you trying to avoid some of the emotions that were involved. I don't sense? consciously know that I avoid it because I do ask to see, to feel them, but obviously not. When you say you ask to feel it, 
remember prayer, and this is something we wanted to cover today, prayer is a pure desire, not an intellectual one. At the moment, you do not have a pure desire to feel your terror. You have an intellectual thought that you should feel your terror, okay. which is very different than a pure desire to feel it. Yeah. Does that make sense? So do I pray for a pure desire? Pray that, to yeah. develop a pure desire yeah. and also look at addressing the reasons why you do not want to feel terror. So look at why you don't want to do it rather than trying to tell yourself that you do. Yep. Does that make sense? Yep. That would be my recommendation. I would just be praying about why I want this situation. Oftentimes when we go through this process of intellectually, which is where you were a while ago, hey, you became intellectually aware, hang on, something's up something's here. Yeah. And, you, and usually then once we are in that phase, we seek some information, we try out some things, and sometimes then we begin to have more of a desire to deal with it emotionally. I feel for yourself, because that hasn't happened, I would be asking myself, okay, I really want this situation, even though intellectually I see there's an issue. Emotionally, I must want it. So God, could you help me find out why I want this? There must be a big reason, because I'm kind of fighting here between my intellect and my desire, you know? Uh, and I think, as, as AJ says, it's a lot about fear, hey? So the type of things, what, what frightens me very much is what I might do. Um, because I have no idea what I do unless I'm with someone who's telling me later what I've done. Um, I think it's very good that you're a little frightened about what I'm you might do. Terrified about what I might do. <laughs> <laughs> because the reality um, is not even you doing it, right? Yes, it, yeah, but you are yes. going to be blamed for it. <laughs> exactly, that's and right. So, yes, I, you know, you have good reason to be a, a little frightened about what you might do in this state. But your fear about what you might do is yes. not great enough to stop you from doing it yet. It's not bigger than whatever the fear is that's keeping you doing it. Okay. Um, if, I ra if I continue to, to raise my soul condition, does that um, necessarily mean that I, will I won't attract um, doing anything too terrible? Um, <laughs> does, it, does it mean it that I wouldn't be able to, I wouldn't then be attracting someone who would make me commit a murder or something that I, I wouldn't consciously ever want to do? Certainly. If um, so, you can't do things even in an out-of-body state. A spirit can't use your body to do things that you would not have some kind of tacit support for doing. Right? So, so the reality is if you raise your soul condition in other areas, the spirit can't you know, influence you to do things that you would not normally do if you were present in your body. However, can I point out that you are much more terrified than you believe at this point? And remember what I said about terror? Terror, terror is an active element that allows violence to continue or occur. When we are terrified, we can be terrified by a spirit who may then influence in, into doing something that we wouldn't normally do. And so this is where I feel it's very important that you need to ad start addressing and seeing, allowing yourself to fully see how much terror is within you and how much you want to get away from your life. Apparently I, I do show a lot of terror when I'm in that place, but I don't remember doing it. Well, that's because there's a, there's a spirit over cloaking you who's doing it through you. Yeah. And that can only be happening because you have enough terror in you to express it in that place. So, but, but you're not wanting to own your terror. Even now in this discussion, actually, you do not want to own the terror. You, you are not being ethical in your management of your terror. Because if you were ethical, you would stay present while you're terrified. When you're not ethical, you're going away from yourself while you're terrified. I don't know I'm going, though. I have no memory of going. No, there was an um. event just before. Remember we said earlier, Mary said earlier, there's an event just before you left that you need to trace your life back to it because that is the trigger for you going. Does that make sense? Remember yeah. we drew that both yesterday and today. We would go along. There's an event happens. Yeah. And then there's the spiral. Okay. You yeah. understand? What you need to do is go back to when that event, the last things you remember, and you need to ask yourself more questions about that because that is the trigger for you leaving. And you've been unwilling to do this. Right? Yep. Okay. You, you yep. just want a solution to the problem without dealing with your terror. I don't think I do, but I must. <laughs> I know. <Yeah. laughs> I know. Yep. Many people who have lots of terror want some alternative solution. 
rather than feeling their terror. And if many of us are honest in the audience, many of you who have come to terror, <laughs> resist, yes, how many of you come to terror and avoid it, yes. See, it's a, it's a very common thing to do. You come to terror and then you think you want it, but, but really you want to run away from it. And in that moment, you'll go out of your body, you'll do different things, you'll distract yourself, you'll eat, you'll take you know, alcohol, drugs, whatever it is to get away. You'll do all sorts of things, including what you're terrified of doing because the spirit's trying to manipulate you into it. So, you know, th that's the trouble with terror, is that terror is not an honourable place of integrity. Terror is, I'm going to do whatever anybody dictates uh, that I'm terrified of. And so terror goes to the highest bidder of violence. Do you see what I mean by that? Yeah. The person who will perpetrate the most violence towards you is the person who will own you. If you stay, the, if, if you have this terror in you and you leave it in you. What you need to do is release the terror so that it's no longer there, then you won't go to the highest violent bidder. So, can you say that again? The person who will perpetrate the most... So the person that, the person that we're, the, who will perpetrate the most violence is usually towards, towards us is the one we're most frightened of. So if we're in a, in a habit of avoiding our fear and terror, uh, then we will do the most things for that person because we're the most afraid of them. So by, by placating them, we get to avoid more fear. So in the end, we end up pleasing people who are very angry and violent. Mm -hmm. yep. But this is also why we're talking about all these subjects today, mm -hmm. because we can make a choice in that situation, even if we've got the terror inside of us, when we reach a situation, if we've got some self-awareness and awareness of what's going on around us, we can go, I can make a choice for righteousness, I can make a choice in harmony with the truth I know, and then, I'll f then the fear will start coming out of me, obviously, because I've, broke, I've taken an action that's yep. not in harmony with placating the fear. So the other part of it is to continue building as much as possible with what we're... These qualities, yeah. 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 Particularly in the case of terror, the biggest quality I feel that needs to be developed is ethics and faith. Right? Because if you have some ethics, you will not go to the highest bidder, no matter how potentially violent they are. You won't do it. You won't go out of your body. You'll stay present no matter how frightened you are. Does that make sense? Yeah, it You'll does. stay with yeah. you. You've learnt this process at a very young age, Nancy, and it's a habit. It's become a habit. You learnt it at a young age for obvious reasons, and we won't go into those, but you know them, I think, well enough. Yeah. And you go, go out of your body. You went out of your body then as a result to get away from the situation, the discomfort, the shame guilt and other emotions that, that were all involved in it, you go out of your body and it's become a habit for you now. So whenever there's a little bit of stress now that occurs in your life, bang, you're out. And this is a habit that's formed over many years that began in your childhood. Yeah. So the key is to develop some more ethics and develop some more faith that you can actually feel terror. Remember, terror is just an emotion. Yep. Who, who feels like getting it tattooed on your wrist? So I'm talking about <laughs> just Terror an emotion. is just an emotion. An emotion. <laughs> <laughs> and emotions are, all emotions are capable, we are capable of experiencing all emotions. So we are capable of experiencing terror. Right? So um, allow yourself to develop the faith that that is true and allow yourself to develop the ethics that whenever I run away from myself, I am out of harmony with ethics on a lot of levels. Firstly, I'm expecting other people to put up with a different person than what I really am, yeah, which is not a very true. ethical thing to do. But also, I'm trying to avoid my own emotions, which is not an ethical thing to do. You know, any person who avoids their own emotions or attempts to is not going to have much success growing. So we need to, you know, hold on to these ethics and pray about those particular things. And in fact, if you read the last part of this scripture, because Mary would just read it again, perhaps, the one a bit about the prayer. Oh, yep. Uh, let's do it from this one, hey? Yep. yep. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. So, so can you see 
when we notice ourselves not having one of these qualities, that's the time to pray about developing a sincere desire to develop that quality. To for, pray to God to bring us situations and circumstances that challenge that those qualities, so that we can develop them. Right. So, and then over the next few days, you'll notice there's another situation that came. Oh, I wasn't ethical there. Another situation came. Oh, I didn't have much faith there. And then you can start developing the qualities with these situations that your soul attracts. Yes, I'd never thought of this situation as being to do with ethics. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Every situation that involves spirits and people on earth interfering with our life in some way is always associated with ethics, interestingly enough, as well as these other qualities. That's why this information was channeled to Paul. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Thank you. Okay, should we go, Christina, right up in the corner? Yep. Kristen? Yeah. Kristen? Yep. Yep, right just there. Yep. Um, hello. Um, when we work towards achieving an end, um, but that end that we're working towards isn't happening or it's not coming to us, how do we know that it's not happening because... Perhaps there's an interference because of a spirit influence or it's not happening because it's actually not meant to be for us. It's not part of our path. Well, firstly, there's nothing, no such thing as meant to be. All right? Remember, we are, we are free will beings, which means that anything we desire can become. So therefore, there's nothing that is not meant to be. But we need to understand, in answer to your question, that there are two possible outcomes generally for any question. One is yes, and the other is no. <laughs> right? So if you're saying we're wanting a certain outcome and it's not happening, then there is only two possible answers to why it's not happening, yes and no. The question is, what is the question? Yes. <laughs> right? So what is the question? Why, the question is, why is it that I express a desire that I feel is pure in its nature and yet, the outcome doesn't come. That's really the question, isn't it? And the answer to that question is very simple. The desire cannot be pure, or it must be out of harmony with love. Otherwise, it would always come. So what I would do, if anything I'm doing in my life is not happening, or desiring to do in my life is not happening, what I would do is I'd ask myself this question. What inside of my desire for this particular thing to occur is out of harmony with love and out of harmony with purity? That's the question I would ask myself. And in that question, if you answer that question for yourself, you will find the thing that's out of harmony. Now, if we don't know, then it comes back to what we just said. Pray to know. So, so you know, God, through this beautiful law that God has made called the law of attraction, can bring you circumstances and events which can show you why something isn't happening the way you want it to happen. So when, our, when our desire is not pure in some way, then spirits can become involved with it. But the, the safeguard against that is to bring that desire into harmony with love. So if we have a desire for a certain thing and, then, and it's not happening, so we can ask ourselves, okay, then we know there must be something that is not in harmony with love in this desire. If I heal this thing inside of myself, then I, one of two things will happen. Either I won't have the desire anymore, or the desire will become purified in its form and the thing will happen. But can I be frank with you? If you were more specific with your question, I would have been able to give you a more direct answer. <laughs> Would you like me to be more specific? Well, you're referring to a certain situation in your own life that is not happening and is, you're um, unwilling to I speak about it. it. Yeah. yeah, I think you might be able to guess that. I'd like, uh, well, my husband and I would like to have children and I've just had my third miscarriage. Yes? Yeah. Okay, so that is far more specific a question that can be given a far more specific answer. Yeah. So you desire to have children but you're having miscarriages. That's the question. We're having difficulty getting pregnant, and yep. then when we get pregnant, we're having miscarriages. Yes. So that is not on this subject. No. Well, I was just wondering about the spirit influence. That's where well, I... Well, you're hoping it's spirit influence. Okay. 
But what if, and I suggest to you this is true, what if it's got nothing to do with spirit influence and it's got everything to do with your emotion? Would you be willing then to consider that? Yep. Mm -hmm. And I'm suggesting to you that it does have everything to do with your emotion. Look sincerely at why you so much want to have a child. Because when we have a role that we place on children, children don't necessarily feel comfortable with us anymore. So look very strongly at your reasons for wanting a child. Be honest with yourself about them. Yep. And for your partner to look if they really do want to have a child. Yep. So or both of you need to look at that. If that's a pure desire for both of you. Can you see that sometimes for men, they want to have a child because they want to please the woman, which is not really about which having a child. not a good child. reason. <laughs> um, and sometimes women or men want to have children because they want to develop their sense of self through this child, which is also not pure. Or so they want someone to love them in their old age. Or they want <laughs> or someone who loves them back. Yeah. Or yeah. someone who will give them unconditional love. Or, you know, there's a long list of reasons why we choose to have a child that's out of harmony with a pure desire. When your desire is pure, the fact that you can become pregnant means you're not infertile. So your desire is pu when your desire is pu pure, you will, you will not only conceive a child, but carry it to full term. Yeah. Thank you. Many uh, women, by the way, just as an aside, many women have found that when they give up the desire to have children, that's when they have the child. Mm. Very well, strange, they adopt that. a child and then suddenly they fall pregnant. Yeah. yeah, they adopt a child and all of a sudden they have two children. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One from their own pregnancy. Um, and this is because they've, they've released a lot of that emotion that allows, that, that, that keeps the child wanting to leave. When the child leaves its body here in, inside the womb, the, a miscarriage automatically occurs. Mm -hmm. yeah. When the child's soul leaves and spirit body leaves the body of the child in the womb, and the only reason why a child would want to do that is because there's some emotions they feel from their environment that they're not comfortable with, they will automatically leave, and when they leave, they terminate themselves. That's what a miscarriage actually is a self-termination from the child's decision. Yeah. And so a, a great thing would be to ask yourself, well, what emotions in me would cause the child to want to leave? And a lot of the times, and I, well, there's a lot of spirit women in the spirit world pretty upset with this particular conversation. Um, there's a lot of others that are really pleased though. Yeah, yeah. but a lot of people do not realise that um, I'm not saying you're to blame, okay? I'm just saying that the child is leaving because it feels emotions that it does not wish to feel from you or your husband or both of you or your environment. So the question to ask yourself is what would those emotions be? Does that make sense? And, you know, often for parents, they have the feeling like, I really want to love a child, I really want to love a child. But actually the feeling is, I need a child, I need a child. And that feeling projected, and I, I'm not saying that that's in your case, but just in general, um, that feeling projected at a baby is very intense. Like, whoa, I've got a lot of holes to fill here once. And can, you know, often we feel like going away in a relationship where someone's wanting us to, do, you know, really fulfil us. And can I make a suggestion that a lot of the times we are not willing to see how intense our emotional projections are upon others. We are not willing to see, and, and in this case I'd ask myself the question if it was me and Mary wanting to have a child and we couldn't have one, the first question I would ask myself is, what emotions inside of me place expectations upon this child before it even comes out of my womb? Also, what does this child give me? What are the reasons why I want the child so badly? Now, many women will find that the main reason why they want a child is because they feel they are incomplete as a woman without having a child. And this is a very much a multi-generational emotion that exists for many women. They do not feel completed as a woman, and, or, and even society has a tendency to suggest this, that they are not complete as a woman unless they have a child. And this is also one reason why women are becoming more and more, uh, are becoming like fertile sexually, 
at younger and younger and younger ages, right down to eight, nine, seven sometimes, right? Children, unfortunately, are able to have a child, whereas back, back 100, 200 years ago, many times they weren't able to have a child, even if they had sex, until 13, 14, 15. And the reason why this is happening is because of this imposition of this emotion that a woman is not a woman until she has a child. And this is something to also look at. Does that make sense? Yeah. But it's off topic. So we'll get back on the topic. Um, if we come... Who's not... Sa Sandra hasn't had a question yet. No. So let's come down to Sandra. And is there someone at the back who hasn't had a question? Hello. Yes. <laughs> I'm just wondering, you said earlier um, that it's easier, it seemed like, I'm not sure whether I got it right, that it's easier to receive, to ask for divine love when you're a spirit. Did I hear that right before when we were talking about faith and um, how spirits... Well, it's easier in some ways, uh, certainly, because, for example, many of you are yet to understand that you have an eternal life. When you die, you arrive in the spirit world and you now know that you haven't died. So straight away, there's an instant feeling, if you're aware that you've died, there's an instant feeling, well, ah, oh, there's life after death. But many of you still are not certain about the truth of that. And the only time many of you will become certain, if you don't deal with that feeling emotionally, is when you die. And then you'll realise, ah, oh, AJ was right, there's life <laughs> after death. Wow, this is a new thing, you know, this is something now I've experienced, so now I know, you know. Now, once you know certain things like that, of course it is easier for you to come to terms with other things being possible. Does that make sense? Here on earth, we have a lot of uh, jaded emotions, uh, emotions of what you would call, um, what's a better Dis word? Disillusionment. Disillusionment. Mean, what's another word? Cynicism. Uh, we have a lot of these kind of emotions. We love doubt because doubt also causes us to avoid action. Right? So many of us actually love doubt. We love to be in a doubting place. We like to be philosophical because it's so great. It helps us never make a choice and a decision. And uh, by the time we die, we have been forced into at least one decision, and that is that we're dead. And, uh, and now we've been forced into a different state, and now we're at least going to investigate what it's like after we've died, right? Can I say some of us really fight that decision, though? Yeah. <laughs> like, for a long time. We'll, we'll be doing some interviews soon about this subject of death, and, and um, honestly, the majority of people on the planet fight death tooth and nail. Why do you think people hang on in their hospital beds for years rather than going to the spirit world? You'd think, in the spirit world, I've got legs, I've got arms, I can move around, I don't have to be bedridden, I don't have to have a hospital, I don't have to have all these things, right? And yet they'd prefer to lay in their bed for five years and be on support systems and everything? Come on! Look, there must be a decision they're making of fear about death that causes them to do that. Once you've died, you, you realise, oh, it was not as painful as you thought it would be, that it frees up you to a lot of other investigations, which are quite interesting to engage, even if you're not on a divine love path. And you also start realising that there is more to life than what you thought. And as a result of that, there is a more of an openness to experimenting with the relationship with God. Many of us on earth get so inundated with the pressures of our life and so uh, confused by the attitude of the people around us that we have no faith whatsoever in God or in a life after death or anything like that. And so we start embracing a life on this planet that we feel is the only life we can have. And as a result of that, when it comes to thinking about spiritual matters, you know, one hour a day is about the most most people do it. Even less. It's pretty rare to do it more than one hour a day for most people because they're so involved in the rest of their life, they give it very, very little thought. Right? And the reason why that is, is because they're busy with their life, busy with their time, busy with their family, busy making a living, busy doing all these other things, but also busy trying to stay in denial, busy trying to stay in their fear, busy trying to even <laughs> deny that they have any fear or any, any other emotion in them. They're busy doing all those things as well. And, and when you pass in the spirit world, you've got a lot more free time. 
and so therefore a lot of time to investigate. It doesn't mean you'll automatically do it, but generally it is a little easier to investigate in the spirit world because of all of those factors. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there was someone over... Christiana? Christi no, or at the uh, back? Right at the back. Yeah. Um, thanks. And then we, want to, we definitely want to move on with it, because there's important things we're missing here. <laughs> Hi, AJ. Um, for many years, I've had spirit overshadow me. I don't know if you call it overcloaking, but they've certainly made their presence known to me. Yep. And I haven't always known, uh, they don't always give me an indication of why they're doing it. Yep. But even as I speak now, I can feel a, a, just a, a, a mild overcloaking. Yeah. And they have different sensations over my face. So, yeah. Um, and the different sensations would be different people. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So I've often wondered if it's good. Sometimes um, I've acted upon the influence of the spirit that's been around me and I've accepted it. But when I have um, acknowledged it as not being myself, as being the total driving force... Um, the spirit has then been revealed and it overshadows me as if it's been flushed out. Yeah. Can I suggest to you, though, that you do actually like it happening? And this is something that I feel many people who, are, who have had these experiences feel. You, you like it happening because it gives you a sense that you know more things than the average person knows. So it hooks into some feelings... Really, it hooks into some feelings of uh, lack of worth, actually, but, but more some feelings of avoiding the feeling of a lack of worth. And, and this is one reason why a lot of people allow spirits to come to them regularly and influence them regularly. Sometimes they make choices and decisions that they weren't then happy with, and they go, oh, maybe it's not as good as what I thought. The reality is that no spirit who is in a loving space will ever wish to overcloak you. That being the case, every spirit who overcloaks you is not in a loving space. So therefore, every spirit who overcloaks you will have some negative reason for doing so. Now, I'm not talking about now spirits who overcloak in a situation where they're healing a person on earth through you or something like that. I'm referring specifically to spirits overcloaking us just to influence our life. Now, many times we like it, and this is what we have to address. This is this issue here and here. We're not, we often are not truthful with ourselves about our worth and how much our worth wants propping up. Right? And we also are not very truthful oftentimes with our ethics, with our righteousness what we actually believe is the right thing to do. Now, many people on this planet are sort of overcloaked on and off through the course of their life, even in the course of a day. And what we need to do is examine honestly our own motivations for allowing such things to occur. This is what we need to do. If we're ethical, we would actually do that. And our own motivations are generally not as pure as we believe them to be. They are driven by some unhealed emotional addictions that drive these particular desires. So if I was having these kind of experiences myself, I would be looking at that area and that area of my suit of armour. Okay. My area of truth with regard to my own emotional injuries about how I feel about myself and my sense of worth and why I want these spirits with me very frequently. And I would also look at the ethics involved, the, righteous, the righteousness involved from God's perspective as to whether it is right for me to continually accept these people's direction. We have met many people, Mary and I, haven't we, in the last five years we've been together, we've met many people who are almost overcloaked completely and who give up their will only for one reason and that is they don't want to take responsibility for their own life. They want these spirits to help them in different areas of the life. The spirits help them make them feel safe and secure and they help them know things that they wouldn't normally know. 
There are people in this audience who are addicted to spirits helping them know things that other people don't know. And they love this, these spirits with them. And these spirits don't have good motives because any person who overcloaks you and gives you those kind of that kind of information generally doesn't have good motives. But we assume their motives are okay because we want their motives to be okay. And we want their motives to be okay because we have a feeling in us, an addiction in us, that when we interact with the spirits in these ways, they give us something that we want. And that's what I would look at if it, in your situation. Okay, thank yep. you. Yep. Let's proceed, shall we, on to the next very important. Yes. So... So if someone shoots you in the head, how fast does it take for you to die, do you know? <laughs> Pretty, pretty quick, right? I love how this weekend it's all about life and death. Like, they shoot you with an arrow. Here, what happens? <laughs> Here. You can see I don't have many hang-ups about death, but anyway. <laughs> but, uh... Okay, so the next part of yeah. our verse is, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So let's look at this helmet, helmet of salvation. How do you spell helmet? Helm yep, E-T. E -T. Helmet of salvation. What's salvation? What's it? I know it's being saved. <laughs> Goodness me. What does that mean? What does, what does being saved mean? What's the opposite of salvation? What's the opposite That's of salvation? Damnation. Is that the opposite of salvation? You see, damnation has a commenta has a um, judgment a, attached to it. Yeah, it's sort of like um, it's not. I don't believe it's the opposite of salvation. But has anybody got any ideas what is the opposite of salvation? Uh, Ange, Ange, at the back, yeah. The back there. Salvation and damnation are real, like... Damnation is a and, religious uh, term taken from the Bible generally that uh, is all about judgment and condemnation and death of a person. That is not what I'm talking about. We're not talking about the opposite of salvation. So being lost, like, like people refer to lost souls? Yes, that's a very good uh, analogy. Let's look at it. Let's say we're here with our soul condition, and this is a certain level of love, what options do we have? We can stay the same. Can we really? <laughs> it's hard to know whether we can stay the same. Pretty much everything in the universe either grows or dies, does it not? Yeah. So it's pretty hard to suggest that we would stay the same by trying to stay the same. In the words of the famous philosopher Bob Dylan, <laughs> Get busy living or get busy dying. <laughs> <laughs> so, can we say then the opposite to salvation is getting busy dying? <laughs> getting busy degrading our soul. And the salvation is then, can we say that's in growing our soul, improving our soul? That, that would be salvation, would it not? Okay. So we've got one way, which is a degradation of our soul, and the other way, which is the saving, if you like, of our soul, the salvation of our soul. And then we've got this fictitious place <laughs> that we think we can maintain called constancy, and it never occurs in nature, and it never incurs with your soul. Isn't that interesting? So let's rub it out. Okay, so there's our two options. Salvation or degradation? Chosen by ourselves. All right? Now, how does the helmet come into place? What does the helmet protect? Nah, you know, it's a silly question, right? Huh? <laughs> of course. The head, the brain, right? What, what is generally our brain taken as? Our mind, our intellect, our reasoning ability, our ability to determine logically what is wrong or right, all of that is a part of occurring in our brain, is it not? So how does that relate to salvation? Joy? Move on. Um, 
um, that if all else fails, we can use our brain and our logic to determine what is the right thing to do or what is, in, in any of these other situations, if we don't know them emotionally, mm -hmm. we can use our brain and our logic to do that and make a right choice. Yes. This is telling me that logic is essential in my relationship with God and essential in my relationship with being able to ward off influence from other people, negative influence in particular. Without logic, I will often revert to emotional choices that are out of harmony with love, but totally in harmony with my condition. Now, how many of you at some point in your past have been so angry that you would have liked the person you were angry with to just die? Right? Right. Now that, that obviously is an emotional feeling, yes? Now it wouldn't have been very logical for you to take the action because you probably wouldn't be in this audience at the moment. You'd probably be in jail for life sentence instead, right? So you can see that your emotions are not always trustworthy. So those of you who thought that the divine love path is all about your emotions, you need to reconsider because it's not all about your emotions. Divine love path is all about receiving divine love and changing your soul so that it becomes more and more in harmony with love and your emotions and everything else will change as a result of that. Now you have to be emotional, you have to allow the emotions to flow in order for that to occur. But the divine love path isn't all about emotion because there's some of your emotions right now, because we're not perfect, right now inside of us, some of our emotions are completely out of harmony with love. And if you felt them, well that's one thing, but if you acted upon them, you could get yourself in very serious soul trouble if you acted upon them. And this is where our God has given us this beautiful tool of our mind, which is actually residing in our spirit body, that influences our brain and therefore influences all of our ability to act through the mind of our spirit body. And it's this mind that needs to be protected. Now, one way that spirits influence us is they drop thoughts into our mind. And many of us unknowingly, all of us generally unknowingly, receive thoughts that we think are our own, but are not. And we are in harmony with those thoughts. We have certain emotions inside of us that allow these thoughts to be dropped into our mind. They're like little email packages so you can think of your mind as your inbox, right? So you've got these little inbox there going, give me, give me information, give me information, right? And there's these little email packets that come from other people's minds. And, and actually there's a description of them in the uh, Robert James Lee's books of these packages. They are actually real. They're packages of thoughts. See, once you're able to do this, and knowingly able to do this, you don't need email. Right? <laughs> that might be a good thing. In my email box, there's like 500 unread emails. So with this method, you can't not read one of them. They just sit there until they're read. So, so you can dismiss them, of course, but, but these packages are available to be fed into your mind. These packages can come from any other person who exists, spirit or on earth. Right. So, if that's the case, we've got these packages and our mind's there, this little inbox processor, and we've got these hot packets of information dropping in. Now, some of the info, you can email yourself, can't you? <laughs> I do it all the time. <laughs> You're a wonderful person. <laughs> Nobody else wants to tell me that, so... <laughs> no, that's not true. Um, <laughs> I do email myself all the time, but most of the time it's information that I want to put Remember somewhere Remember to do that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but we, email, we can email ourselves and we can receive emails from other people. 
And it's the same with our thoughts. So if you can think of thoughts as emails, thoughts can come from yourself, but they can also come from other people. And you need some kind of protective method that, that you need to use to, to determine whether you should act upon these certain thoughts or not. Can you see that? Because what if some, some, someone sends you a thought that says, kill AJ. I, I know four or five people in this audience right now who have had those thoughts. So, somebody's given them those thoughts, right? And they've come up and told me that they've had these thoughts. Now, if you had that thought and then, then you had no method of determining what is right or what is wrong or no logic, what would you do? You might act upon it. Right? You might think it's your own thought and act upon that. Obviously, not a good idea. Not just from my perspective, <laughs> but from your soul's perspective. Right? So, so the helmet is going to help you logically determine things that you need to be able to determine in order to stay in harmony with what you know, intellectually at least, is the right thing to do. See, the heart is all about what you feel is the right thing to do. Now, sometimes your heart can be wrong, yes? Because we might have emotions in our heart that, that cause us to feel things, that cause us to have certain addictions that lead us down a certain path, right? So what is going to be the regulator of that? We need to have some also concept intellectually of what is logically right that we can impose upon or use in harmony with the other part of us, the heart-based part of us, the, the righteous part of us, the part of us that determines ethics and morality. And they work together in order to maintain our system in harmony with love and truth. So when our heart's not working right, in other words, I have a desire to do something that's obviously out of harmony with love, right, at least our head might regulate our behaviour through this application of logic. It can also work in the reverse, can't it? Mm -hmm. Because if I have some knowledge of love, if I have grown and I have understood certain things about love in my soul, then I can use, in a situation where I don't know what the right thing is to do, I can use my intellect logically based on what I already know about love to make a loving choice, can't yeah. I? Yeah. yeah. Many people say to us, oh, I don't know what love would do. Uh, I just can't agree with that statement. I'm sorry. Almost everybody on the planet knows what love would do because all you've got to do is ask yourself about the ethical question, what would I like done to me? And there's a very good way there to determine what love would do, right, most of the time. And if that's not accurate, then your logic will start telling you things as well, like, yeah, what you're doing now is actually, like, it's going to cause you some damage, right? And the logic can help you make some decisions. So, for example, a person wants to commit suicide. That is a heart-based desire, probably, yes? Driven by some kind of emotion of wanting to avoid their life or some kind of rage or some kind of terrible sadness that they feel they can't feel, and so they want to commit suicide. Now, if they just followed their heart, they'd probably do it. However, if they have the helmet of salvation on, and remember, of course, if they just followed their heart under that circumstances, all these spirits would be coming and saying, yeah, 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 go for it, go for it. This is how you do it. They'll give you a list of ways to do it. There's many people who have contemplated suicide who've told me they had a list of 15 or 20 different ways they could do it. Where do you think they got that list from? From many spirits who have actually done it and have given them ways that have worked, right? Now, if you've got this protective headgear on, this helmet of salvation, where you are focused on, the, you are focused, remember the focus of this mind is on growing rather than degrading. That's what it means to have a helmet of salvation. The focus of the mind, the logical focus of this mind, is to help you grow rather than help you destroy yourself. That's what it means to have the helmet of salvation on. We are only going to intellectually think about what is going to assist us to grow. We are not going to ever contemplate anything that will assist us to destroy ourselves. 
Right? That's what we mean by this helmet. So this helmet is working in this direction. So whenever a situation comes up like, oh, I feel like committing suicide, uh, hang on a sec, logically that is not going to help me grow. It terminates life, which is not a growth. It also probably is going to affect other people's lives, which is not going to help them to grow. And then on top of that, I'm going to probably pass over with some feelings about it that I still have, which is not going to be a very logical thing to do. It's none of it's going to help me grow. If anything, it's going to help me degrade myself, degrade my condition. So would I choose to do it? If I had the helmet on, wouldn't choose to do it. No matter how many spirits were around me telling me to do it, I still would not do it if the helmet's on. Because I'm focused, my mind is focused on growing my soul, on saving my own soul, rather than destroying it. Does that make sense to everyone? That's the purpose of the helmet of salvation. To focus on growing rather than self-destruction. Yeah? That's what we need to focus on. So Joy and Natalie. I think the greatest gift of the book group, Mary, has been the practice of um, developing my abilities to self-reflect. And um, That's good, Yvonne. That was the point. Yeah, yeah and I really feel, um, just thinking about it then when Jesus was talking, that I probably use my brain more now than before when I just came automatically from that place of I know where you just act automatically as opposed to thinking through and yeah. Yeah. And once you become at one with God you will act automatically but because you're at one with God everything you do will be, be a loving choice and so you won't have to think about it so much. But before then there is a need for self-reflection. Yeah, and that's, as we were saying to someone earlier, that's how your awareness of your emotional condition often starts, is having this self-reflective process. And it, it is intellectual, but also emotional. You can use your intellect to help you navigate, I suppose. Yeah. 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 Hmm. Natalie? So yesterday when I asked you about discernment of, because sometimes the thoughts can sound so much like your own, mm -hmm then the question that I need to be asking myself is, with the thoughts that I'm hearing, corresponding to feelings inside of me, is it going to help me grow or is it going to degrade myself? Exactly. That's, that's the, the question. And if it's going to help me grow, then the chances are it could be a loving spirit that's encouraging my growth. Exactly. And obviously the opposite. If it's going to help me destroy myself or degrade in my condition or degrade somebody else's condition, then it's probably not a loving spirit who's giving me this information. Big aha yep. moment for me, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and this is also what we were talking about, about earlier, uh, giving away our power or just trusting, just taking guidance. So when you, when you have that discernment inside of yourself, then you are growing, but you can also accept advice that will help you grow even more. Whereas if you just blanketly take everything on. Uh, and I've felt in the past that the struggle with discernment has been the overwhelm of all the feelings that uh, it's like, in, sometimes in those moments where the feelings are coming up so strongly, y y it's hard to be clear on what you're thinking and, and especially if there's a lot of thoughts coming at you in well, those moments. If, if we're in our feelings and not fully in them, yeah. there'll be huge numbers of thoughts coming from all sorts of spirits about the subject we're feeling about but not yet fully feeling. And when I'm fully feeling, I'm not thinking anything. Yeah, when you're fully <laughs> feeling, you don't, you'll find that there, it's very hard for spirits to drop any thought into your mind. You are fully engaged in the feeling, and so therefore very difficult for any spirit to drop thoughts in, them, in your mind. But if they do, you can always ask yourself the question, is this going to help me grow, or is this going to derive my condition? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And this is where I feel many of us uh, avoid... Uh, asking ourselves questions like that. You know, we, we, we take an action and then we say, oh, it's because I felt to do it. Uh, that's not a good reason to do something, to be honest with you, because we know we're imperfect and therefore we could have imperfect feelings. So we shouldn't just do something just because, we, because we felt to do it. Like some people come up often and tell us uh, something about how they were projecting at us three days ago, a certain emotion, and, and, I, and I feel like going, saying to most of you, to be frank, why are you telling me this? Like, I don't need to know that. Even if I do know it, I don't need to know it. 
Like, I don't need to know what your feelings were three days ago that you projected at me. Like, what I, what I would love to know is whether, you know, you worked through something as a result of it. That would be fantastic. Right? And we often want to tell persons things because we actually want to make a point with them and we're not looking at our underlying motive. You know, oh, I was angry with you three days ago because you did this. And then I realised, da 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 And I'd say to the person, well, I'm sorry, but you're still angry with me now. And the uh, proof of that is that you had to come up and tell me that you were angry with me three days ago and you wanted to dump some of that on me. Why did you want to do that? Right? Now, often spirits get involved in these kind of things. You know, they like doing that because it makes the other person, maybe, if, maybe not so much myself, but it can make another person feel bad about themselves, attack themselves and feel bad about what they have done and go into guilt and all these other things that we have a tendency to want to cause in other people to control their behaviour. And spirits are so happy for us to do that. So this is where we need to ask ourselves even further with this helmet of salvation, is it also going to assist the saving of another person or is it going to degrade their condition? So remember, if we're ethical, we will ask the same question of ourselves that we would also ask for the assistance of another. So if I'm about to take an action that I know is probably going to harm the person in their life and I still go ahead and take it, then can you see that's out of harmony with having this helmet of salvation on? Because now we're not focused on the saving of the other person. We want to destroy them. And to be frank, there are a lot of emotions in most people about wanting to destroy others that don't agree with you or harm you or have hurt you in the past or whatever it is. Right? If we have a focus of, no, I want to grow and I want to assist every single person that I meet to grow, then I would ask myself the question, is this feeling that I have towards them, is the action I'm going to take in this particular case, are the words that I'm going to speak in this particular case, are they going to help them grow or are they just going to destroy them? From God's perspective, are they going to help them grow or is it just going to destroy them? What is my motivation? Is my motivation to make them feel bad? or to say something that I wouldn't normally say, or to get away with something, some behaviour that I, you know, that I just want to get away with? What's my underlying motivation? Is my motivation to, because I love them and I want them to grow? Is my motivation because I love myself and I want myself to grow? This is what it means to use your logic and to have your head covered with the helmet of salvation. Does everyone get, understand that? Pretty logical. Hmm. So you imagine now, see, all of these things we've so far covered are all defensive. Aren't they? They're defensive mechanisms. If you think about it, the only thing that's attacking in here is the sword, is it not? So, so everything else that we've gone through, the feet, the loins, the breastplate, the helmet, the face, shield of faith, it's all defensive apparatus in a war. So, so these are all defensive apparatus that can assist us to, to reduce the amount of spirit influence that we're under. So this is how we positively respond to spirit influence, by having the development of these particular tools as a part of our nature. And these particular tools, every single one of them plays a part in helping us with regard to spirit influence. It can greatly assist us once we know what part of ourselves is being challenged by the particular thing or event that is being projected at us at the time. Then we come to this thing. Which is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, um, does anyone know when Paul wrote the book of Ephesians? Not many Barbara, Christians in the audience. Barbara's eh? got a hand up. I thought it was a few years after your death. Yeah, around, I think it was around 12 or 13 years after my death, but it's, it, it, it's near the middle of the first century, right? In the... 2,000 years ago almost. When did the Bible get put together? Does anyone know that? If we go to Graham up the back there. Yeah. It was under King Constantine in 364. 
5 AD, was it? Well, it started around 320, 320. 325, and then it went through and there were a number of different uh, meetings that he had with a synod that put together what became what is called the Bible canon. So when Paul there mentions the word of God, did the Bible exist when he said those words? No. So, so logically, he cannot be referring to the Bible. What would he be referring to? Many Christians would say he is, yeah. but he can't be because the Bible wasn't created by that stage. So I, yeah, Liam? So Liam, if we have them. Uh, the Talmud or whatever the Jewish scriptures are referring to? That was uh, what was available to him, but that's not what he believed to be the word of God. Yep. yep. So... Barbara? I think he was referring to you and your teachings. Um, a little more so, but uh, there's still more to it than that. So, Karen? God's truth. God's truth, yes, as defined by? You. <laughs> no, I don't define God's truth. <laughs> Do we? Yep, just with this is a wild card. The commandments? No, because the commandments came from men, actually. And Paul knew that by this time. Yep. So if we uh, go to... Yvonne's got the Yvonne's mic. has got the mic, so I'll, I'll go to you. But I don't normally do that, but <laughs> I will do it in this case. <laughs> go on, fire away. Um, this is a wild card, too, but from his own experience with, in his relationship with God... What so, he's learned. so what was his personal experience in his relationship with God? That's the question we've got yeah. to ask. So what, what, what is it? What have you learned through your own personal experience? What have, I, what have I learned through my own personal experience? Yeah. I have learned that God loves me. I have learned that God is good. So you call that uh, truth? Yes. Yep. Um... I don't know. I've learnt. It's hard to distinguish what I've learnt from you and what I've actually learnt from God. Mm. Yeah, interesting. You need to forget about what you've learnt from me. Yeah. And find out what you've learnt from God. But um, the other things I learned from God is what is loving, because I feel it. Right. I feel if I've done something that's not loving. So what would so you call feedback? that? Being able to see yourself and all that stuff. Humility. Ah. <laughs> Yeah. And I've learnt love from God. Why? Because I've felt his love. Okay, so yeah. you've felt love from God. You've felt mm. divine love into you, right? Mm. Okay. Isn't this exactly what Paul had available to him? I'm, I'm guessing that's true. Yeah. So the humility create, is created, created an openness to truth, mm. and the openness to truth meant that you desired love at some point and received some, and that told you what the absolute truth was, didn't it? Yes. About and at least one subject. Mm. Yep. You haven't resolved all subjects, of course, because if you've had it, you would already be at one with God, right? Mm. And even then you would not have resolved all because absolute truth is, a, is continuously growing even after that. There's Infinite. A com there's a common concept that once we're perfect, we also know everything, and that's not true. Yeah. Perfection doesn't mean knowing everything. It means perfection in the way we express our love. Yeah. So, so we know the absolute truth and through this process. So, so here we've got this thing which is called the sword of the spirit. Sword of the spirit. Which is also the word of God. And sorry, babe, what did you say? Sorry, it says the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. Okay, which is the word of God. So we know that to get the word of God in our heart, we have to go through a process of becoming humble, opening to truth, and eventually getting to the point where we receive love. And with the love, we receive revelation, which is the word of God, through that connection. And that connection is very dependent upon the Holy Spirit. Without the connection with the Holy Spirit, the love cannot flow. And so therefore we will not receive the word of God. Each of us are capable of doing that individually. You do not need another person to do that. So it's an individual process. 
This is the word of God. This is how the word of God comes to you right? through this process. Okay, so he knew that. Right? That's what he was taught and he knew that. And he knew that was what I was teaching. Remember, he was only alive a few years after my death and so he could talk to people about what I was teaching and he found out much of this truth. Okay, so when we look at that, then we have to come to, well, how is it the sword? What, what, how does this relate to this sword thing? Jason, you want to say? <laughs> well, that's it. That's where you're going out. You're, you're, it's like a giving flow. So all of the other ones are like defensive. So you're sort of like um, stopping or defending. And now with the sword, you're going on the charge with the word or the truth. And that's the giving out to... But with Everyone. what attitude are you going on the charge? Oh, with love and humility and, and a desire to um, um, share truths around love. And yeah, and remember, your, focus, your helmet's focused on sa saving, not destroying people. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't mean it in a warrior sense. Yeah, no, that's yeah, no, fine. Yeah, no, it's fine. Yep. These are just questions. Yeah. And not judgments. <laughs> so the sword is the, like... Now I'm going forward. I'm going out into the world to True, share. but there's something about a sword. What does it do? It's Pretty focused. obvious. Slices between things. It's penetrating. There's a scripture in the Bible that says, it can even separate the bone from the marrow. Right? So it has to be something very sharp. And often, you know, when a soldier had a sword, they'd be there sharpening her up. You just ask Corny about that, sharpen her up every single day, sharpen sword. You never know when you're going to be able to have to use it. So you want a very, very sharp sword. Now, what, how could that be likened to something spiritual in this case? To separate truth from untruth. Yes, this is very important, isn't it? So this sword of truth, or the sword of the spirit, is actually a way that we can actually cut through all the bull crap that goes on in the world, right, to put it <laughs> bluntly, and actually determine in every situation what is the truth, not only for ourselves, but also because we are interested in the saving of all men and women, not just ourselves, we can do it for others too, right? This is the beauty of it. Now, you imagine now that you're getting attacked by spirits, Spirits are trying to influence you to do something that you know for certain is an unloving influence. You know for certain these spirits are not in a good condition. What would the sword of the spirit get you to do? Attack? <laughs> Ange, can we, can we have the mic there? And then on this side, Chris, up there, thanks. Take action and speak the truth. Yes, it would do that, Chris. Cut through the lies. Cuts through all the lies, yes, but not in an angry way like you just uh, <laughs> described. Because <laughs> Chris just ran around. <laughs> like that. Not like that, because, because we'd be coming from a place of humility and love, wouldn't we, for the person. So it wouldn't be like that. It would be, <laughs> it'd be like that. <laughs> but I, I feel because it's the sword of the spirit, it's... This sword can only exist when we're in harmony with God, can't it? Yes. This sword can only... Uh, this sword does not even exist when we no longer have a connection with God. So, so as soon as our connection with God has failed, we can't use the sword because it doesn't exist. Remember, it's the sword of the Spirit. It's the sword that is actually the result of our connection with God. Does everyone get that? So this sword can only exist through this connection with the Holy Spirit that is maintained through which love flows. So what, it, what, it's, a, what, it, what it's basically suggesting is that this sword only exists when we have connection with God. Now, when you have a connection with God, do you feel like going like that with truth? <laughs> or do you feel like just giving the truth? <laughs> da, 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 da. <laughs> Isn't it more like that? Isn't it more like a loving feeling coming out of you towards the truth and exposing the truth and using this sword to just cut your way through 
all of the rubbish that's present. Can you see how that would help you with spirits? And I also see that it would help me if I am walking out into the world and I'm encountering other people who may or may not be influenced by spirits in their interaction with me. If I'm, if I'm using this sword of truth, love and humility, that because of the sort of the spirit, it will expose that within mm. those people very rapidly, won't it? So mm. it's also the indirect, we've talked a lot about direct spirit influence, but yeah. w I would say as well that it would expose the indirect influences you may be under. Just your very presence in a state of connection with God means that you almost become God's sword yourself mm. to determine between truth and error. Every interaction you have with everybody will challenge them or free them at some point, right? Because of the state you're in personally. Now, if you think about it from that perspective, we're not now, we are using it as an attacking device in the sense that we are trying, and the, the purpose of this is we want to cut through error. We don't want to leave error on the planet that everybody then imbibes and lives with for thousands of years afterwards with huge amounts of pain. What we would like to do is expose the error, destroy it through its exposure, and then what we're left with is just the truth. And the truth now can influence any person's life in any religion, in any walk of life. Every single person on the planet can be influenced by this truth. And as a, as a beautiful part of that, it means that we have the ability as humanity to grow. So you know how we were talking about salvation? Now we're talking about the salvation of an entire race of people, not just ourselves. The beauty of this particular device is that it assists us to assist the world to change. But it is only available to us when we have a connection with God. So you know every time you've told the truth in anger, that wasn't it. Every time you've told the truth in resentment, that wasn't it either. Every time you told the truth when you were crying your heart out, it was closer to it, but it's still not it. Because once you're in a state of connection with God in love, the other person will feel your love generally when you're giving the truth. Now, they might not always do that, of course, because they might be an error and therefore very resistive to it. But you will deliver it in the manner that displays your own connection with it and your own connection with God. So this device becomes an important part too in your relationship with spirits. Spirits often come to you who are in error and what do you tell them to do? Rack off. <laughs> Rack off. Many of you, right? Or you go into some kind of fear, or you go into some kind of self-attack, or you go and do what they want. If, instead of doing all of those things, we decided to engage them with the Word of God that we know, the things that we have personally learned, in conjunction with our relationship with God, and we decided to engage them in a conversation and help them work through different things, as a result, we would be able to express our love to them. That would have the greatest effect on their life imaginable, wouldn't it, in comparison to all the others, in comparison to running away or avoiding it or trying to get out of the situation or telling them to get lost or getting in a rage with them or all of those different things they are not going to be effective ways of helping a person. They are also not effective ways of helping any person on earth, by the way. Mm. Have you noticed that? Mm. By now, we should have noticed that if we've been associated with the path for a while. Jason. My soul is degraded. I've done an unloving act, and obviously the spirit's involved. If I've dealt with... Or sometimes I feel like I've been trying to talk to spirit, but obviously not dealing with the emotion. So I'm yep. trying to give some truths or something. Yep. So if I deal with the emotion and, and actually cleared it and maybe even healed it, and then try to communicate then with the spirit, how long does spirits sort of generally hang around? Like because of that law of attraction thing, if you've dealt with an emotion, how, you know, like do they sort of like, well, I can't influence him, I'm out of here, or do you got some kind of? Um, <laughs> 
contract. You, <laughs> yeah, you'd be surprised actually how much of a positive effect it has on them. Firstly, when you deal with the underlying emotion, you remove inside of yourself an addiction. Right? Once the addiction inside of yourself is removed, the spirit who's trying to connect to your addiction can no longer connect to it. So now they're in a challenge. They're now automatically challenged. Now, do you know what they normally do with that? They first try to bribe you. Remember I gave a talk, bribery, threats, fear, blackmail. Wow. <laughs> they tried to bribe you firstly. Bribe, bribing is like a nice kind suggestion of a, with a carrot at the end of it. You know, like the carrot on the stick bleeding the horse type of idea. Now when that doesn't work, they give up the bribe, generally, and then what do they do? They threaten you. And by this stage, most people have already caved. Because we receive a couple of threats from the spirits, you know, with a bit of intention behind it, and all of a sudden, all right, all right, I'll do that. That's what we normally do. We give back into the situation. Well, a person who's in this space here, connected with God, doesn't do that. And so what the spirit does then is blackmail you. By now, they're starting to get violent with you. So it's pretty obvious now who you're dealing with. Before it might have not been obvious, now it is. Right? Once they get to this stage, you can talk to them about it all. Talk to them about their anger. Yes, you need to feel your anger. I'm not feeding your addictions anymore, but you need to feel your anger. You need to go through some processes like this. And after, and after you demonstrate to them that fear is not your primary motivator, they will give up blackmail. Now, once they do that, it's very interesting. I have had in my personal history, many times in this life with spirits and also in the first century, spirits who went through that cycle with me, only in the end to become supporters of the divine truth. Because that, at that point, all of their emotions are starting to be challenged and all I've done then is encourage them to feel them and talk their way through them and help them through that process. And you now, often you can end up with a friend <laughs> at the end of it, right? Another friend. And uh, in fact, I have many friends and, my, and Mary has many friends in the spirit world who actually harmed us while we were on earth because of this because we didn't respond to their bribe, their threat, or their blackmail, and eventually helped them through getting through some emotions. So, and it started by not feeding addictions. Just so I get a, a, a visual in my own mind, when you say they're dropping thoughts in, they could be just like, just visually, just someone right there, just going, you know, da 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 yeah. When it gets more intense, are they actually like, just visually jumping up and down and screaming at you? Like, yeah, yeah. When, when it gets really intense and they are really in a rage, uh, and by the way, rage is not as bad as it gets. There's another thing on top of rage. Resentment, that gets pretty bad because resentment is a cold rage. Do you know what I mean by a cold rage? Mm -hmm. In a rage, a person is generally very expressive, yelling and screaming at, you know. Animated. At, animated. You know, all this rage and anger being projected at you, and it's almost like childlike in some ways, right, when the person's like that. However, when they go into cold, clinical rage and resentment, then it's very hard to help a spirit, or a person, actually. A cold, clinical rage is the source of most people planning to destroy another. You think about your own plans to destroy others when you've had them, if you've ever had them. Can you see how they're always related to getting into this cold place, this hard, steely. bitter, cold... Steely place. rage. What was it called? A steely, steely rage. Steely rage, yeah. yeah. Right? And that, that is very hard to help a person in that place. When a person just in rage, jumping up and down, that's fine. And many spirits are like that, in a rage, jumping up and down when you don't meet their addictions. But most of us get so afraid, we go back to meeting their addictions. So it's literally like you could have tens or hundreds of people jumping up and down, yelling at you, but you can't see or hear it. Because I've got ringing in my ears all the time, and sometimes yeah. it, the tone just 
goes way up or way down. And, yep. and I, yeah. I, I hear it, but I just write, okay, spirits, but I have no idea what it yep. means. I frequently have millions of spirits screaming and yelling at me, wanting to kill me and all sorts of things. Yep. Thanks. Sometimes it would be so amazing, wouldn't it, to have like a visual representation of what's happening? No, no. He says <laughs> no. no. <laughs> it helps because you know who, it, what condition they're in. It's great. I, I feel it's great when spirits actually display their true nature with you, even if it's rage. Because in the end, you know their condition. You know who to trust and who not to trust. You know who to listen to and who not to listen to. The problem that many of us have is that we listen to people who are enraged. People who are enraged are not usually very logical, but we listen to them. We, we, we just absorb it. Yeah? Eagle? I was just wondering, um, with all these plates, uh, can it be related to a physical problem if one of those plates are penetrated? For example, I'll give my example. In my uh, teenage years, I got very resentful to my father, mm -hmm. and I started breaking a uh, leg. Yep, yep, certainly. Every one of these things that we take off, if you like, these, you know, these principles that we take off of ourselves, in other words, not practice them, exposes not only our spiritual body to the influence of spirits, but also remember that our spiritual body is over our material body. So, so here's our spiritual body, and our material body is pretty much of similar size and nature, and our spirit body maintains the energy of the physical body. So if a spirit can upset the energy of our spirit body in a certain location, then we can attract certain events now in that location including sicknesses and accidents. They all become attracted because of that exposure. Yeah. So it's a very real thing that many of us have had sicknesses and diseases and accidents that have almost been completely spirit-influenced. Of course, we've had the opening to it because of some hole in our armour. Right? And, we, and that hole in our armour has caused the influence to be able to occur and therefore affect our life. Yep. Yep. Barbara, thanks. Um, AJ, when my father passed, um, he was in a rage with me. Mm -hmm. um, obviously because I hadn't shared... Um, well, I was doing things that he didn't want me to do. Mm -hmm. And for weeks and weeks, my arm got heavier and heavier and heavier, and I could hardly move it. And Your it was, right arm. It was my right arm. Yep. And um, once we, um, it was identified that um, my father was, oh, shit, your father's there, and he's in a rage with you, and he's yep. got you by the arm, and he's shaking you and shaking you and shaking you. Yep. Once we started touching the area, massaging it, it all bruised, the yep. whole area just bruised. And you could see, well, it felt like, well, it looked like that that's where his fingerprints were. Yep. Is that possible? Yes, certainly. Um, the energy systems he would be upsetting in your arm, he'd, he'd be physically doing that. He wouldn't even necessarily be conscious, but he'd be grabbing you sorry, sorry, on this side, yes, the right side, because that's the side the male would be doing it, shaking you, like physically trying to shake you. But because of your openness, to influence from the male, because you're afraid of men and open to their influence, you have an energetic opening in that side of your body, and that then causes that body to be the body itself and the spirit body to have the energy systems upset. As soon as the energy systems are upset in terms of the flow, now there's a potential for bruising and even all sorts of things to start developing, diseases and all sorts of things, depending on how severe it becomes. Certainly. There are, like I say, there are so many spirits involved in sicknesses and illnesses and accidents. Of course, we are open to them because we don't have the armour on, but the reality is that their influence is an ever-present fact in our day-to-day -day life and many of us take medication and do other things as a direct result of trying to combat some of these influences. Of course, it doesn't work very well, but 
That's what we attempt to do. Well, we spoke with him anyway at the time, and he, he and I felt he moved on almost immediately because the arm healed. Yes, yeah. once it, once you realised what it is, and then you realised you were being influenced by your father. Once you go through that realisation, he also probably has some realisations. Oh boy, I am in a rage with her, and I have been shaking her, and it's harming her body, and so forth. And he might have felt about that. And even but even if he didn't, just you healing that particular part of listening to dad would actually make it heal up as a result. So you know how many of you have aches and pains everywhere, yes? Different places, everybody? Every one of those places has probably got a spirit connected to it. Um, due to some kind of uh, interaction that's going on that you're preventing with inside of yourself emotionally. And uh, it's frequent, like it still happens to myself and Mary. Probably going, it will continue to happen once you, until you've healed yourself from, from that. But this can help protect you from being influenced spiritually into actions to avoid it. You see? A lot of people take actions to avoid pain, not understanding that it's pain from spirits with different holes that we have in ourselves that is being mixed together and we're trying to choose some kind of medication or some kind of other thing to overcome it when the reality is the only way to avoid it is to actually fully experience our own part in it and then it will go completely. Many of, it, many of you still don't believe that and so you choose many things of avoidance, you know, still different drugs or whatever, you know, I mean medical prescribed ones. Um, are often chosen just to avoid something, even a headache tablet. You know, we often do things like that, not understanding that we've got surrounded by ten spirits at the moment who are yelling and screaming at us and all we needed to do is cry. You know? So that's not frequently the case. So James? I just wanted to ask about the, um, like the nausea sort of feeling of wanting to vomit um, a lot. Is that... <laughs> AJ's laughing. <laughs> is that um, spirit? I'm, I'm not laughing at you. I, just... Yeah, I know. I understand. Yeah, <laughs> I've, I've um, had the same problem many times. Yeah, I just so want to know I'm what it's laughing. about because it's becoming a lot more f frequent. So I've been sort of trying to look, self-reflect upon who's around me at the time and what's going on, and I feel it's about some fear or terror. No, surely it's not know? about fear. Yeah. <laughs> surely, surely it's not. Yeah, of course. Good old it's fear. Good, good old fear. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and so. when we start to experience fear, Jane, which is very different than recognising we have it, you actually will start feeling it in your body. And you will go through things like vomiting, uh, feeling very, very sick in your stomach. And a lot of this is about processing through some of your fear emotionally. And when you come out of that, so what we, went, we go through, we have been through, Mary and I both, have been through many times where we've had to process through a fear emotionally, including vomiting for a couple of days and all sorts of things. And then, uh, then it just all clears up and the spirit influence that created it all just goes away once you allow yourself to feel it. If you notice, Jane, uh, you will probably find that you've been taking some actions lately that trigger your fear. And the fact that you're having a physical response to it is showing that you, you're more willing to actually experience the fear rather than go rigid to it. Mm. Okay. So it's a great sign, actually. Yeah. Is it? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it? that you're having really... some physical response. I know it feels uncomfortable physically, but it's a great sign when your body is physically letting things out in this way. Remember that you're, a lot of your emotions are stored in... They're all stored in your soul, but they all have a physiological response in both of your bodies. So your bodies will go through processes as you release the emotion. Yeah, you yeah. won't be able to avoid them. Yeah. Okay. Mm. And that's why also too, like you were saying before, some on our body a lot more conditions are coming up. A, a yeah, lot more, skin I'm conditions, finding. little Just patches here, things little things flaring there. flaring up a lot more yeah. quickly. You'll find the, the more refined the process becomes, the more rapid when you're out of harmony with the process, things that come up and disappear as well. So I've had things come up. Disappear, come up, disappear, come up, disappear. I've had grey hairs come, disappear. I've had all sorts of things happen, depending on what I'm resisting at the time. So yeah. it's not just one, it's like could be five. Yeah, yeah. No, like at the moment, I don't know if you noticed, but right there, you see there? I've got sort of like a, like a patch in my leg, just there, 
It's just like, it looks different than the rest of my leg, doesn't it? Can you see it? I'll bring it up closely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it looks very red. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, that's me resisting something, right? And I've got a fairly good idea what it is, but I'm still working my way through it. But while I resist it, spirits can connect to that area, pull out the energy from that area. That area almost feels like numb as a result. Yeah, does it sort of go numb, sort of... Sometimes. Um, it just depends on what type, type of energetic of draw there is from yep. the spirit and with yourself. Yep. And then when I work through the issue, it patches itself up. It's been much worse than that. It went so bad that it went so hard that all the skin started just peeling off and flaking off automatically, just by itself. I never injured it, nothing ever happened. Just, just happened, right? These are the kind of things that happen <laughs> as you work through different things emotionally. And also, oh. just one last thing, when you're laying at bed at night about to go to sleep, can it intensify sort of spirits hooking into some of those holes, some of those conditions? Certainly. Can it, can it intensify those times? Yeah. Yep. This is why some of you don't like going to sleep or going to bed, and this is also why some of you don't like waking up. Cool. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Yep. As I said before, if we can stay present in our body for as much as possible time, feel its pain, we'll get closer to the emotion than trying to avoid it. Yeah. Now, it must be getting pretty late. Yep. What is the time? Five to four. Okay. Um, it's about um, um, channeling spirits, and um, I started to open myself to uh, channeling larger groups of um, malevolent spirits who were visiting me. Mm. And um, I thought <laughs> I thought I had enough um, faith that I was uh, feeling that there was hope because it's been a long journey to yeah. get to that. Yeah. And I, I thought and I believed that these spirits visited me because I... I was in the same condition as them, and they weren't very happy, they weren't very nice. Um, I did see them, they were very angry and yelling at me. And um, after, when they first did that, I allowed a little bit, and then I said, I can't talk to you now because you're just so angry. So I said, when you calm down, I'll talk to you another day. When they came back, um, they... Uh, when I explained what I was doing and I said, you can see what I'm doing and, and I said, you don't need to look at me, you go and see other people who know how to do it better. But, um, but I have faith that I can do this. Um, they called me a hypocrite and a whole lot of horrible things. And, um, and anyway, after a couple of these meetings with them, I noticed I was... Uh, just shutting down and 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 not feeling good and I'm asking the question I thought I had enough sort of faith that I could progress in the sense that I believe that I have a, a chance now um, but wh why did I why did I shut down to to talking to anyone then. Like, it took me a good week to even want to talk to God again and my spirit guides, and it just just made me feel so, like, oh, I just didn't want to go there. And I'm afraid to channel again because I don't feel I'm that strong. It was just that they came, and I could see them, and I could, you know, that... There were, there were a lot of them, and um, I wanted to, to um, I wanted to be of service to people who are not in such great state, because I don't feel my own state is that great, but if they could be on with me, um, since they're watching, you know. We can both answer your question probably five minutes ago, but <laughs> that's, that's okay, Lily. And we understand the problem. Yep. So, what do you think is happening? 
The, the key thing is, you know how we've been talking all weekend about this graph where you're going along, you're going along, things are okay, then suddenly, like you said, I suddenly shut down all my mediumship abilities and all of my connection with God. And you know the event that caused that, don't you? It was the attack from these spirits. So the key thing is just to go back to that point, you know what it is, and recognise what were the emotions triggered in me in that interaction that I skipped over. I feel even more importantly though, Laureline, we've got to ask ourselves one question when we're attempting to help somebody. And that question is, do the people want help? Um, they came to me. They and came to you to attack you. And they did attack you, didn't and they? And they did attack you and yeah. you allowed it. Does that make sense? And it's okay like, that it's happened, so don't punish yourself about that. right? Because it's actually that hole that they got That's into. That's the hole you, they got in. Yeah. The, your desire, this was the hole here, the desire for you to punish yourself and not have a good opinion of yourself. You mean I allowed them to attack me? Yes. What I could have done... In the guise of helping them. In the guise of... Would, uh, can I put to everyone... If you allow people to attack you in, in the guise that you are helping them, you are actually just enabling them to attack you. So you're actually not helping them, you are actually harming them further because you are allowing something that is actually going to damage their soul and yours. So, so it's one thing for you to allow yourself to feel the attack and have a cry about it, because that's what actually occurred, as Mary suggested, feel the attack, have a big cry about how you were attacked, and even I think though you loved them. You didn't do that. You thought, I'm a hypocrite. Which, so you agreed with them. You agreed you with them, yeah. You didn't girdle yourself with truth. You, you let them attack your, your feelings of worth. And, and because you attack your own feelings of worth, this is the hole that you have. So while you might have faith, and I do believe you have quite a lot, you do have a hole in the loins skirted with truth about your own worth. And, and when spirits come along, they can see that hole and they, you beauty, she's giving us an opportunity to have a go at her, right? And so they have a go. Now, that's a bit different than a group of spirits who come to you, even though they're malevolent, come to you and say, oh, we've noticed you've changing and we want to know how you change, you know? That's very different than a group of spirits who come just to attack Lorleen because they've, Lorleen's given, her, given them an opportunity to. So can you see how this part has been the, the issue of truth about yourself? Can I just make a general statement about truth about yourself? Many of you completely reject the truth about yourself because you're very happy to accept that you're bad but you're not very happy to accept that you are the pinnacle of God's creation. In other words, you are rejecting God's truth about yourself. Right? This is something that you have a tendency to still do because there's some emotions to let, to let go of, right? So when you have this tendency, you're rejecting God's opinion of you you're saying, oh, I'm really bad, I'm really bad, I'm terrible, you know, I'm not that good. I, you know, these are the constant messages coming out of you. And then spirits in the spirit world are looking for people. Many of them are looking for people. They're just scanning the population, looking for people with that emotion, that problem with this area here. And they're looking for people just so that they can attack them, make the person feel bad about themselves, and then have a laugh and laugh that they've humiliated the person and made the person feel worse. Many spirits do that. They're just like people on earth who get onto forums looking for somebody to attack and they'll get onto almost any forum and just attack anybody. They're the same kind of person as that. Right? They can do it in an unseen way without any mu much response back from the individual and so they just do it. That's the kind of person we're dealing with. And if you allow yourself to engage an actual uh, you know, conversation with these ones, Firstly, determine their underlying intention. 
Unfortunately, if you have not protected this area of yourself, their underlying intention is possibly going to be to destroy you. Right? And under those circumstances, you would not have an interaction with them. So, with them. Now, what we've done, even with the media, is allowed the media to engage us, and then when they display their intention, we deny any further contact with them. Does that make sense? For exactly the same reason, because they're just looking for an opportunity to attack. They're exactly the same as the spirits who came and attacked you, but they're on earth in the physical. Yeah? But as I mentioned before, sometimes when they attack, I have a, an opening in that area as well. And sometimes I go into this spiral until I remember what has actually occurred and I grieve what's occurred. Then, back in connection with God, back in connection with spirits, myself, soulmate. But before, that's why I said go back to that point and you missed emotion there. You missed the truth yeah. of what actually happened. So we do need to understand that it is, a, it is an attraction that we've attracted. We've attracted a group of people who want to attack us. So in your case, you have attracted a group of people who want to attack you in order to make you feel bad about yourself. And the whole emotionally is, I am willing to go along with them. I am willing to allow an attack and feel worse about myself as a result of it. And that's the thing that God is trying to assist us to heal through the interaction. See, once we heal that, then those spirits can come, but there won't be the opening. They can say and swear at you and curse you and you know, try to kill you as much as they're able and whatever, and it will have no effect on your happiness. It'll have no effect on your self-esteem. It'll have no effect on your worth. And then you know you've healed that particular area of, of, of your soul. Does that make sense? Okay, well, we it's four to... o'clock, guys. So, um, and we haven't finished the verse. We haven't finished the verse either. So we'd like to do that because the last uh, line of the verse uh, uh, is pretty important to understand. So can we do that? Yep. Good. What if I read the full verse again and we'll have the last bit? And that so by this stage we should have a pretty good understanding of this now, yes? Yeah, yep. compared to when we first read it yesterday, hey? Yep. Okay. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your scan stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heaven, heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full, full armour of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist or guarding your loins, <laughs> with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil ones. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Yeah, you can see why we love it, right? It's got, it's so, it uses expressive language to describe some basic qualities that we need to develop if we're going to positively respond to spirit influence. But let's look at this last area just for a moment, this area of prayer. Often people come up to myself and Mary and ask us many questions. One of the very first things I say to people is, have you prayed about this issue? Most of the time, most people who come up to ask me the question sort of look at me a bit blankly and go, well, yes, I've prayed, but, uh, or oh, what do you mean? Or, you know, they, they're not sure what I even mean when I say, have you prayed about this issue? What do I mean when I say, have you prayed about this issue? What do you think I mean? If we go to Cabell, over there, and then Denise, is it? Yeah. Have we asked God about the issue? But what, let's, let's be more definitive about what it means to ask God. 
um, to earnestly. Okay, so you're using some words now that <laughs> describes emotion. So earnest, yeah. Yeah, just earnestly feel. Um, feel, yeah. It's okay if you're stuck. Yeah, I'm stuck. No worries, let's go to Denise. Denise, yeah. Denise, just here. In, yeah. To have a huge desire and openness to ask God to show us the truth. Desire, yes. Yeah. Not only, f so a desire and openness is very good. Desire often creates an openness and, and it's for, we want to know the truth of the issue, not what we want to believe the truth to be. <laughs> Most of us ask for truth, but that's actually really what we would like to believe that we're asking for, and be rather willing. than what is God's truth about the matter. Good. And be willing to hear that or to you need, feel that. Yes, a willingness. The desire will create a willingness to listen. Yes. How, how does God tell us things? If I'm not open to God and I'm not feeling God's emotions, how does God tell me things? Ah, yes, that's right. This amazing law of attraction. So there would also need to be, wouldn't there, a desire and openness to feel what is happening in my attractions, what my soul is actually currently attracting. Right? Many people who come up to ask us questions, I say, what, is, what have you attracted on this matter uh, over the last week or month or whatever it is? Uh, good. So now we're starting to get the feeling of prayer. So we get Alex up the back. Um. I also feel like you're saying, um, have you taken responsibility for this yourself? Yes, uh, so there needs to be a feeling of I want to take responsibility for this thing occurring that I am attracting in my life. I want to um, actually not only know what it is, but not hope that it's some other person's problem. Right? Many of us uh, want to know, many of you do ask me questions and the feeling I get from you is you want me to say that it's something other than you that caused the problem in your life. Now that's a bit hard for me to do, right? Because you are the centre of your life, so it's pretty likely that anything is happening to you, it has something to do with what's going on inside of you, isn't it? Rather than something that's happening in a spirit or something that's happening elsewhere, they are all effects of what's going on inside of you. Yep, so that's good. A desire to take responsibility is a very important part of the issue, yes? So can you see that the more we study, the question was about prayer, the more we study prayer, the more we see that it has to have a lot of sincerity in it, doesn't it? Now, when you came up, come up and ask me a question, there is not a single question that you can ask me that you couldn't ask God first. Isn't that not true? And in fact, in my opinion, God's a far better person to ask because she actually knows the answers better than I do. And it would make sense to me that the person to ask is the person who knows the answers. <laughs> right? And the other beauty of asking God is God's on your shoulder every single moment of your life. You know, you have to organise a time. When is it now? It's like a week and a half, two weeks or three weeks in advance with me before you'll actually get any attention whatsoever. And then if you email me a question, my goodness, that might be eight months, ten months before I get to answer that or even longer. I'd love to see the look on some people's faces where sometimes you just go through your inbox and go, oh, I really should write to this person and send it back and it's literally like ten months after they ask the question. I wonder sometimes whether they even want to know the answer anymore. <laughs> but, but that's the way it is. Like that. But God's not like that. God can give you instant answers. God's able to give attention equally to all of her children, including you. If you develop this relationship with God through prayer, 
all the answers will come to you just like everything I ask for comes to me. In exactly the same manner, in fact. And God doesn't think I'm special and you're not. God doesn't feel that way. God's not like a parent on earth who goes, yeah, I've got my special son and then I've got all the others. <laughs> but God's not like that. God's going, no, all of my sons and daughters are special to me. I want to engage each of them individually and equally. Every time you place me in the position of answering your question, you are forgetting how important your relationship with God is and how unimportant your relationship with me is. Your relationship with God is going to change your life. It's going to change your soul. Your relationship with me can't do any of those things. I, I can't change your life. I can't give you God's love. I can't change your soul. I can make some suggestions. That's all I can do. I can't do anything else for you. God can do all these other things for you that I can't do. And I'll never be able to do them, I don't believe. And if I do at some point in the future, I have a strong feeling it's going to be some long point in the future before I can do them. But God can do them now, right now for you. So why would you not do this? I, I, I don't sometimes understand why you would not do that. You see, you seem to have this, um, this concept that God is limited because you can't see her and you can't feel her. And none of that's true. Most of the time you can't see me because I'm out of your company and you can't feel me because I'm no, you're, you're nowhere near me. Right? And yet that doesn't mean that I don't exist and that does not mean that I can't have some influence on your life. God is in, immensely infinite in power and understanding and in love God has all those things to a far greater extent than I do. What's the point of connecting to somebody who's limited when you could connect to a person who's unlimited? Can you see the logic of that? It doesn't make much logical sense doing that, does it? Now, sure, I'm trying to share with you how to manage your relationship with God, how to develop this relationship. And I believe strongly that if you follow some of that advice, you'll benefit a lot. But with your individual day-to-day -day life questions, I do not have the capacity, even if I know what the answer is, I don't have the capacity to share with a hundred people even the answer, let alone a thousand or a million. God can share with billions and billions and billions and billions of people at the same time the truth and give each single one of those people in just perfect response every single time every single time God can give you every single thing you need every single thing every single thing most of the things you think you need you don't by the way and that's why God's not giving them to you <laughs> and the things that you w think you don't need God's going yeah this is really important <laughs> and you're going no no I don't think that's important I'll ask AJ <laughs> and and the reality is that this is the connection that we're trying to encourage you to develop. This really strong personal relationship with God that will mean that you will be completely happy in God's love. And I can't give you God's love either, by the way. I can't, I can't even give you what God's love has entered me to you. Does that make sense? Like only God can share her love with you. So, so sometimes it seems strange to me that people want to ask me questions and want to have individual discussions with me and all of those kind of things when really the healing relationship is not going to be the relationship you have with me. It's going to be the relationship you have with God. And every bit of time you waste on our relationship, the one you have with me, you actually are wasting the time you have opportunity to develop the time with God. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't have a relationship, because I'd love to have a relationship with you. Many of you, I feel, are wonderful people. <laughs> and I love relationships <laughs> with wonderful people. 
but I, I am not reliant on you and you cannot be reliant on me. We need to change this attitude to be reliant on God. And prayer is the way in which we do this. Like That's the important part. So when you feel under attack and when you feel under influence and when you feel all these different things, take it all to God in your relationship with God. Stop denying God's power because that's what we're doing when we don't take it to God. We're basically saying to God, yeah, you know, these spirits, they're more powerful than you are. All right? That's really what we're saying. And when you come to me asking me questions and I ask you, have you taken it to God? And you go, yes, but I don't seem to be getting an answer. I'm going, how can that be true? Like, that's not possible. Every time I ask the question of God, I get an answer. When I ask the question with this attitude, I get an answer. Surely you would too if you had the same attitude. So I'd say to you, question your attitude if you're not getting an answer. Yeah. And also, this, as this verse tells us, it's saying pray on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. So it's not just like, oh, yeah, God, could you just let me know about this thing? It's saying a lot of the time, God, could you, I'm, I'm not understanding, could you show me more? Can you, you know, it's all kind, it says be alert, be alert, keep on praying, ask more. So it's really engaging this process of prayer that's not just a dutiful prayer or a, oh yeah, God, this is bugging me, could you show me? It's, it's as you're talking about developing this relationship that's dynamic and constant and you're really asking from your heart for a lot of things for a lot of the time. God is really interested in you becoming the best you can be. That's God's primary objective, helping you become what she designed you to become if you choose it. That's what God wants to accomplish with you. Now, if God wants to accomplish that with you and God is the only person who can actually help you become that person, then surely that should be the primary relationship that needs to be developed. Now, I'm okay to answer people's questions but I have a severe limitation. I am limita limited at this point in time, here on earth, by time. I'm limited by space. I'm limited by location. I'm limited by power. I'm limited by my own things that I have to heal at the present. I've got lots of limitations. All right? There's already been three questions you can't answer today. There's like already been three questions <laughs> <laughs> I can't answer today. <laughs> right? And I'm sure there'll be far more in the times <laughs> to come. And God can answer every one of them. God can do all of the things I can't do. God can be with each of you wherever you are at the same time. I can't do that. I'm a limited person. God can help you have feelings all at the same time that you all need to have. God can have individual conversations with each of you and give you as much attention as you're able to cope with and handle at any one point in time, all at the same time. This is the immense power of the God that created us, right? Surely it makes more sense to take everything to that being than it does to take everything to Jesus. Can you see that? It makes much more sense. That's why I do that. Yeah. So what I would like to encourage you to do, there are times in the future where you may feel under attack. There are times in the future where you may feel influenced by spirits. Sometimes in the future you'll feel like, why have I ever listened to any idiot who claimed himself to be Jesus? you actually feel that. Many of you have already felt that, right, at different times. And my suggestion to you is to remind yourself, this is not about me. It's not about Jesus. It's about your relationship with God. This is about protecting your character and nature. This is about developing qualities inside of yourself that will stay with you forever if you develop them appro appropriately. God is interested in your character God wants you to become the best person you can possibly be. 
Of course, I would like the same thing to happen, but I don't have the capacity to assist you as God does. So that is the relationship we need to develop. When you feel alone, you are not alone. When you feel attacked by these spirits, they are not the most powerful beings around you. Right? God is. And then God's spirits and angels who are actually in this place of love themselves. They are powerful too. More powerful than these nasty spirits who sometimes come around you. Mm -hmm. And if you develop these particular qualities through these interactions that you have with spirits, these brighter spirits and God can greatly assist you in your own progression towards God. If you allow these holes to remain in your own suit of armour, it is very, very difficult for a benevolent spirit or God to assist you to grow because you're always going to cave into your fear. You're always going to cave into the desire for violence. You're always going to cave into self-attack. You know, the you know a feeling of a lack of worth you're always going to cave into a lack of ethics you'll always cave in by going oh, i don't know if i really believe any of this anyway right but if you keep remembering that it is your relationship with god that is going to bring you all other things then you will want to develop these particular qualities and these qualities will greatly assist you in having happiness on the path to God. So that's what I would like to leave you with. Can I just reflect to all of you? Uh, yesterday when we started this talk, we said, oh, you know, co with Spirit Influence, what's it all about? And honestly, the feeling, the mood was like, oh, fear, oh, it's terrible. And the feeling in all of you guys now when we go, co with Spirit Influence, can you feel the difference? It's like, yeah, we can do it. <laughs> And there's almost an excitement in you, like, which develops once you understand how. This is the beauty of how. It, it, it just allows you to experiment with new things and new truths, and it also allows you to feel safe and secure in a process that allows you to go through development, you know? But honestly, when I picture myself behind the shield of faith, it's like, whew, I can relax back here. You know, there's a shield of faith. I can, I can be myself. I can breathe. And sometimes I feel like putting on this armour that we've been talking about feels heavy. You know, it feels like, whoa, I'm going to have to choose righteousness. Whoa, I'm going to have to walk in the way of peace. And it seems like the boots are going to be heavy and the breastplate's going to weigh me down. But the, the beauty is the more that you do it, you strengthen under the armour. You become a strong, developed person who has a good sense of themselves, who has a good sense of integrity. And in the end, you, it's almost like you're busting out of the armour in terms of your growth and strength and, and wisdom, really. Mm -hmm. So um, I just feel excited for all of you to, to start working with this stuff because mm. I know it's, it's really helped me a lot. So, mm. yeah. And I also know that many of you um, are, are definitely okay with having your loins girded with something. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, a, lot, a lot of times, if our loins weren't girded with something, you'd feel very naked. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so even if you start with that one, you know, the, the <laughs> desire to treat yourself better than you currently do, the desire to honour your own experience, the desire to feel your sense of worth more, to acknowledge that God is trying to give you this truth that you are the pinnacle of her creation. If you could even just start with that one, there would be a huge amount of positive benefit in your life, but also a huge amount of benefit in your interactions with spirits. Uh, it would help you immensely, just that one thing. But imagine if you could use all of these things. You'd be a fairly self-sufficient person in your relationship with God, wouldn't you? Yeah. You'd also feel a lot, probably a lot happier in your relationship with God. You'd be happier walking through the world knowing that nothing can really harm you or affect you. Yeah. Because you have these underlying qualities. And even if you die... 
you're still not harmed because you've still got these qualities. You're passing the spirit world with these qualities. You're going to attract the people with these qualities. You know? And this is what I love about speaking with you guys is because you know, you're now attracting together a group of people who, who have a desire to develop these qualities. Right? And I know many of you have some little problems with each other and bickerings and fights with each other and so forth, but at the end of the day, there is still this underlying desire in everyone present to actually begin to develop these personal qualities. And that, that is a beautiful thing. God sees that beauty in you and acknowledges it. Yeah. So we'd like to thank you yeah, for the last... thank you, guys. May I say? Um, I'm not sure what uh, we really have planned from now on. I think Mary, Mary's got the schedule. I think mostly it's just uh, book groups on Wednesdays. Wednesdays at 1 o'clock. Um, 1, guys. I'm sorry, can't please everyone. Um, but... It was fairly well in the ballpark of one till three, and that probably suits us better for summer as well. So one till three for book group at Wandai Town Hall. Um, um, aside from that, we don't have any other events planned locally um, this month or next, but there may be another seminar we might organise before we go down to Kentucky. We haven't decided yet. Yep. So um, just keep an eye on that. Myself and Mary are trying to have a few days off <laughs> over the coming uh, month because uh, we've had a pretty busy time the last eight so uh, months or so. So what we're trying to do is just uh, is work through some of our own issues and, uh, that we would like to do, deal with. And so we're trying to take a little bit of time. But that being said, there will be certain things that will be happening through the months which we'll let you know about on the website or on Mary's blog. We'd also like to thank those of you who donated to us while we're away. Without your support, we wouldn't have probably survived while we're away. Thank you very um, much. So we'd like to thank you for that. And uh, we would also like to thank you for your donations today and yesterday as well. So thank, thank you so much for, for supporting what, what we're doing. Your support helps us immensely in a lot of different areas. And we'd also like, on the behalf of some of the others you've been donating to, to thank you for their, uh, donating to them as well. Many of them now, you, you've got Lena and Igor pretty much full-time doing what they're doing. Luli's pretty much full-time doing what she's doing. So there's quite a number, a number of people now who are starting to get uh, to do things even on a full-time basis. And of course, they have no other source of funds other than your donations too. So we'd just like, on their behalf, to thank you too for their... And would you like to thank them for their work? Yeah. Yeah. We have a lot of uh, new things planned, as we outlined yesterday, and we have a lot of things that we're trying to achieve. Uh, we're also trying to do some... There's a, there's a few little things we're trying to do to, to shorten things so that presenta some presentations on YouTube are only five minutes or ten minutes. Um, and th what this will do, I feel, is give the people with a short attention span <laughs> the ability to, exe to he's, examine he's some divine truth. He's he's um, <laughs> So yeah, this is one thing we're also trying to do for the future. So um, there's a lot of different things that we're attempting to achieve and, uh, and your support and funds help us to do all of those things. So we'd, we'd like to thank you very much for your support. Very much. And yeah. there are many people we met overseas who would like to express to you their gratitude for you being open uh, with your emotional condition and also your life experience. And many of you have expressed personal things in your own life on, on record, on camera, that has enabled these people to connect with you. And many of them mention many of you they by name. Like they, you, <laughs> they of feel them. like they know you, lots of them. They feel like they know you. And they, you know, they mention many of you by name. And we would just love to thank you for your m developing openness and truthfulness about your life and your willingness to expose that so that other people may benefit from your experience. And we just feel that's a lovely gift that you are giving to other people. And I feel sometimes you don't see it as a gift. And we'd just like to remind you that there are many people overseas in particular who mm. regularly watch only the videos who, that, uh, that feel it's an immense gift that you're giving them. So they we'd really like to appreciate thank you for that yeah. gift as well. Yeah. 
I don't think there's anything else we need to cover before we go. So. so thank you for your time again today. And we look forward to seeing you at some point in the future. We don't know when, as usual. <laughs> <laughs> See you later, guys. Thank you.